Thank you so much, um, Leslie, um, Omar, for the introduction, um, and for all of you uh, for being here uh, right now. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to uh, share. And by all means, um, this is meant to be a conversation. Um, so I hope that um, you feel it's a safe space to just ask questions in chat, and I'd be happy to, uh, to respond to them. Um, and I am going to be speaking to the thematic current of modeling. So without further ado. <clears throat> Hello, welcome. Um, this is my talk uh, called Auto Reverse, A Blueprint of Future Past. Um, I am enamored by 80s technology. That's just a symptom of being born in the 70s. So, you know, pardon me for the very period reference to auto reverse and to physical media in general. Um, but I think physical media is making a comeback. Um, so maybe it's it's back in vogue. Um, I think the term auto reverse is fascinating for me because it talks about a switching uh, between what is construed as the past and as the future. They're um, they're in some ways multi-stable or inter interchangeable. <clears throat> So let's play. I am zooming from the lovely land of California, um, which goes by many names, but as Paramount Pictures would like you to believe, as I look outside of my window um, here in Los Angeles, I could be imagining that I'm in the Kentucky mountains or I could be in you know, Venice, Italy, um, based on me choosing to see California from different vantage points. And I think it introduces the fact that in terms of modeling the future, the future as an intentional construction, um, you're constantly grappling with all the different ways by which everyone is understanding their present moment, their present you know, um, historical trajectory, um, and their own personal wishes for the future that they wish to imagine. <clears throat> I spend a lot of my spare time um, creating these um, apocalyptic images of Los Angeles. And I think the purpose is of twofold. Um, one, um, things that I, I love and respect and admire, uh, like the theme building when I get out of the, um, out of the, uh, the airport at LAX, um, all of these kind of totems of both construction and also consumption. How do I think about, you know, revisiting this moment that we're in, um, in this, in the themes of, um, were we modeling for, um, a planet that was habitable? Are we thinking about um, extending beyond this kind of current fascination with novelty and spectacle um, towards something that is a little bit more sustainable? How do we push beyond artifice and the rom romantic um, idea of you know, veneer uh, to something that feels substantive that isn't always about distraction, but is about um, interrogating meaning and finding things below uh, these different you know, sedimentary layers um, as mark making would explore. And in looking at these post, uh, these post LA apocalyptic images, I'm incredibly moved uh, to act. And I think it's interesting that many of the tools uh, in terms of modeling the future um, are very seemingly scientific, um, which I'll go through. But I think it's also important to realize that the future itself is incredibly plastic, right? It is, a, it is an intentional construction, um, but also one that we have to imagine. I think when you step back and you look at um, anything from the films that are coming out to a lot of you know, science fiction movies that are translating into films, you're realizing that we are kind of creating a world that was imagined you know, by writers you know, decades ago, in some cases centuries, um, a world of flying cars, um, a world of telepathy. Um, a lot of these fascinations um, were you know, writerly um, notions. And it's interesting to think about this current moment. Is it just an unfolding of the past, or are we truly bringing about a future um, that we want to see? And in some cases, you know, I feel free to remix um, some of these images, like this space shuttle titled Ebony, or reimagine, you know, signage um, along the highway um, that might say, "If angels are wishes, then where signs are provocations to imagine what is the future that we want to model? What is the future that we wish to bring about?" A lot of future design centers around this idea of looking forward, um, looking forward into a moment um, that potentially looks like something that resembles a catastrophe, maybe not a full on aftermath, but ultimately any design brief um, is an invitation to reimagine you know, a trajectory, 
where we're heading, where we're going. Um, its impetus is usually to solve a problem um, through a specific audience that has a designated need. Um, and ultimately, through the resources, um, usually planetary and human, um, the idea is to steer away from something that is less desirable towards something that is preferred. Um, so the Voros Cone projects a preferable future, which is the, you know, the straightaway um, angle, the preferable future, which is a little bit of a detour, the plausible future, which is um, if we were to increase the amount of knowledge that we have about a subject matter and the amount of resources brought to bear, we could actually extend to something much bigger, all the way through to the limits of actually what is truly materially possible, the laws of physics, which is the outer uh, rim of the cone. And we project um, what we know now to be, you know, um, political inputs, economic inputs, socio-cultural inputs, technological inputs, ecological inputs, and legal. And this is known as, you know, the PESL inputs. And these are essentially extrapolated to imagine, you know, how each of these inputs might manifest in different time horizons of a year, five years, 10 years, 15 years. Um, and it has this sense of gravitas. It has this sense of certainty as many you know, tools and frameworks do. Um, I mean, I wanna be a, a tad bit skeptical. I want to introduce a level of criticality to these tools because in some ways it's a unidirectional projection. Um, it assumes that we're looking in one direction and it's assuming that we're moving towards something that gets better over time. And it's assuming that the people who've been identified as the audience, um, the beneficiaries of this objective, um, you know, aren't, aren't at odds with people who might be harmed in this effort. And I think it's particularly flawed. And if we look back in the last two years, um, the turbulence of where we're at with our climate crisis, um, how we're treating each other as fellow humans, um, how we seem to not be able to delve into a deeper sense of empathy that extends beyond um, nationalism or our kind of screen mediated experiences. Um, these tools might have to be re-examined and on the underlying assumptions even around these tools. In many ways, um, I'm reassured by a lot of these, you know, very, you know, simple inventions, right, that sometimes are just these kind of witty designs, like the Necker cube. The idea that many of you are seeing a cube that's pointed down, and some of you are saying, no, it's a cube that's pointed up. And it embodies a particular phenomenon called multi-stable perception, which is that um, we might experience momentary dissonance between the two realities of directionality, um, but we can only bear it for so long and then we snap to a particular um, vantage point. Um, and then we hold that and we might even disagree with, with many people who are looking at the same image. But I think multi-stability as a concept is incredibly fascinating um, from the languages that we switch back and forth from, whether it's code switching, whether it's looking at different perspectives or vantage points, a simple tool can invite ways to maybe even see that the Boros cone is only looking in one particular vantage point, one particular vector. Or as Sam Gross would say, uh, from one snail to another snail, I don't care if she's a tape dispenser, I love her. And here we see this amazing ability for a snail to see a tape dispenser as another snail, while the other snail may say, oh my goodness, this tape, this, this, this snail is totally um, gone bonkers. It does embody this ability for multi-stability to create imagined worlds or to be able to see things as other things, to be able to see constraints as opportunities. And I think this ultimately is the great arsenal, I think, of those um, who choose to be creative in this world. Or this wonderful um, riddle, this cone of um, an elephant that encounters, you know, six blind monks, and ultimately they get into a bitter disagreement about the true nature of the elephant. Um, there is a monk that's holding a tail that's saying this is this is a fan. It's a monk that's holding a leg and saying this is a tree trunk. One that's holding the tusk and saying this is a spear. And they're all right. And what's fascinating about this riddle is that they all have partial truths. And it's only through conversation and debate and kind of interrogating the true nature of something that we might realize there were only a piece to a much larger whole. Or as the indinkra of this, uh, of this powerful meaning of Sankofa would term it, um, this idea of unidirectional projection, this idea that we're looking off into a distance in the future is this shiny object that we're walking towards, it suggests something otherwise, and that actually it's a process of sometimes, you know, returning and retrieving 
something that you've over, overlooked. And I think this is incredibly important um, because I would argue that some of the most powerful makers um, are referring back to you know, their own personal traumas or, or moments that are the most painful. And this is incredibly fascinating because it means that future design or how we model an intentional world that we choose to build is not about escapism. It's about reconciliation. It's about how we start to collapse past, present, and future along a particular continuum. And I think it also starts to welcome in different perspectives in terms of what are the frameworks that we're using and are they succumbing to a particular centrism, um, whether it's human centrism, of uh, placing humans as you know the apex, the apex rulers of the, of the world, or whether we're looking at you know this greater ecology of which we're playing a minor role, or whether it's you know, Eurocentrum, or whether we're looking at Eurocentric you know, notions of a faster future. And I think when I start to toggle between you know this idea of Sankofa, the ideas of you know, our fascination with speed, whether it's, you know, the, you know, um, the futurists and um, thinking about, you know, rapid movements and the excitation of machinery um, or the 80s preoccupation with the personal computer. Um, I look back at this Man Ray um, poster for the London Underground and it's incredibly fascinating because we see uh, the London Underground mark um, apparently spinning in motion and we see this, you know, this a moment where we imagine that the London Underground emblem has become Saturn. And it's this place where we look at something that we know and then something that feels otherworldly. And I think it's interesting that this particular type of, you know, fantastical leap of faith um, was something that was incredibly exciting because I think we were, we were trying to look beyond, you know, where we were um, and to imagine other worlds. But I think maybe within the realm of um, are we going to be, you know, colonizing them? Are we going to be planting a flag? What are we going to be doing when we actually um, get to Saturn? And I think this idea of speed and speed as it relates to design is, is fascinating. When we look at the origins of certain you know, terms like stereotype, um, stereotype actually comes from printing and it comes from the printer's desire uh, to print books faster and cheaper. Um, so it's interesting that we use a term that refers to the ways in which we might you know, kind of constrain um, you know, the silhouettes of a, of, a, of a group of people um, into a very narrow specified notion actually comes from printing press, this idea of being able to make a plate of the recto and the verso of a book to be able to print both sides of the book at the same time. And I think it's interesting to go between this idea of a stereotype and maybe one of, you know, a unifying thread. I think all of us who are making things um, revisit a particular center of gravity, whether that might start as an origin um, based in trauma, or whether this is one that is based in a, a passion or something we're, you know, forever excited about, reminds me of this um, interview between Gene Siskel and Steven Spielberg, where Gene Siskel says to Steven Spielberg, um, if you could reduce your entire body of work to a single frame, what frame would that be? And it, by all means, it's an impossible question for most people. And Steven Spielberg takes one second and he says, well, it'd be the, the boy standing in the doorway of Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Because all of my films speak to the draw and the epic quality of something that is unseeable. When you think about Jaws and you're thinking about, you know, the, the terror of actually the fact that you can't see the shark, it's just a shark fin, or this idea of you can't see the source uh, of the lights that are shining into this doorway. Um, or that, you know, in Schindler's List, the, the, the girl in the red dress is this momentary moment of color in an otherwise grayscale film. Um, it's very interesting to think about, you know, these unifying threads that contrast this idea of stereotype and reconciling what is a faster way for one to make something in one's own practice, but ultimately, um, how do we make sure that we're not doing something that's cookie cutter? So back to Saturn. Um, I'm reminded that Saturn um, in many ways exists in the past uh, as much as exists in the future, because um, of course it is the birthplace of Sun Ra. Um, and I love that Afrocentrism starts to remix rules of Newtonian physics and Eurocentric trajectory in this ability to be able to sample uh, different qualities of, um, of Egypt and outer space and um, you know, science fiction and advanced technology to be able to create a greater sense of possibility. And to me, this is incredible in terms of modeling the future uh, because the future isn't a Newtonian construction. 
it isn't a line of sight into something that is um, a shiny object in the future. It is potentially an imagined act of both imagining one's past and imagining one's future simultaneously. So imagine, imagination itself exists in both directions. So back to the Walkman. What's fascinating when you look at the Walkman is we see two arrows. Now before auto reverse was a mechanical possibility, um, you essentially just played a tape head in a single direction. And for all intents and purposes, play happened from left to right, right? It was a clockwise rotation. Without a reverse, which was once a rewind became a fast forward, it was once playing forward is now playing backwards. This specific mechanical evolution created a momentary hiccup in terms of designers who were trying to capture the fact that time or progress happened in different directions. I love this reminder of directionality in the 40th anniversary of the Walkman, where we see this figure of the 40th um, that is moving from right to left. And in some ways, it's, it's shocking because we tend to think of progress as happening from left to right, which is, for the most part, how it's lensed in our kind of Western framing of time. And we start to think of, you know, Dexter and Sinister and, you know, the left hand being Sinister and the right hand, you know, being um, being dexterous, that actual directionality itself is encoded with meaning, is encoded with a sense of, um, of right or wrong. So when I look back at physical media and I think of looking at, you know, a tape that looks quote unquote rewound, you know, I imagine progress happening a very specific direction, but then I have to remind myself of auto reverse and that this could also be, you know, the end of the side that I want to listen to. And going back to directionality, it's interesting to think about you know, something as innocent, quote unquote, as an arrow. Um, we think of the playhead as pointing, you know, as a triangle that's pointing towards a particular direction. And it's 1870s when we see, you know, the water wheel, uh, the first use of an arrow as a directional symbol. And again, thinking all the way back to the Boros cone and how we're thinking about this intentional construction of the future. And we think that our symbol um, of direction itself is actually a weapon that becomes the playhead, that becomes codified over time from the arrow uh, to the mathematical symbol um, to 1956, where it starts to become um, up-leveled by designers um, using arrows in wayfinding to 1973, where the play button is codified in the same year as Buckingham Knicks. And as technology evolves, it starts to contest a lot of these symbols. Um, at one point, the play button was actually what we now would see as the volume symbol, because you press this button and sound came out, right? So volume is sound and sound is play. But then you have the evolution of machines that were doing things like playing music. And so is it more specific to not just any sound, it's specifically music. So you have a 16th note with an arrow pointing to the right, um, which is great until the dictaphone, until we start to record our own voice. So now we're talking about things that are beyond just playing music. So we end up with a play button that solves all of these scenarios. And the original play button, this volume symbol becomes a volume symbol. The same year in 1973, as we have, you know, the arrow becoming codified as the play symbol, we have, you know, the GUI um, happening at Xerox Park that would inspire Steve Jobs to create the graphical user interface. A hundred years later, from the QWERTY keyboard imagined by the Remington, the Remington 2. It's fascinating to think about the fact that sometimes we're imagining a unidirectional future, right? A projection of what could be. We're utilizing tools that have succumbed to a dominant design paradigm, right? We look at our keyboards. My keyboard is echoing the keyboard that goes back to 1873. And it's interesting to think about, you know, this huge time horizon between this particular moment and this moment, which designs become dominant and why uh, do industry dictate this, um, do people dictate this, who ultimately are the inputs and who is steering this ability for us to truly model the future versus stay in these particular grooves, these specific patterns. And of course, this would be fast forward. And at some point, Fast forward were three arrows and rewind was three arrows and play of course was a 16th note with an arrow and stop just said stop because we hadn't arrived at the idea of a square for being stop and record are those wavy lines. 
And it's interesting to think about the realities that we are currently building, right? When we think about the fact that, you know, now that we're beyond physical media, we're dealing with streaming, we're really talking about play and pause. We don't really stop anymore. We don't really rewind anymore. We essentially play, pause, and we're able to kind of toggle where we are um, in a particular type of media. But now we're switching or toggling between, you know, diminished reality, which I think is very interesting, which is the reduction or elimination of certain type of inputs, unfiltered reality, which I guess would be the Zoom. Um, I don't have any, you know, particular, you know, um, displays or, um, or kind of emoji that are happening in my background or avatars, augmented reality, which would be some type of augmentation or AR, and virtual, which would be a completely kind of escapist, you know, reality. So this is our new set of stereo controls where we're actually, you know, moving between, you know, different realities altogether. And so how we're thinking about modeling the future, of course, now gets into edge case complexity, because I could be imagining creating a certain future design scenario, but even in that one scenario could be different depending on the context that I'm in or the particular reality mode that I'm in between diminished, unfiltered, augmented, and virtual. Oh, about that stop sign which originally all stop signs were white square signs um, first imagined in, in Detroit. And then of course, um, we start to understand that the different sides, the amount of sides of a sign um, could communicate its level of urgency, right? So a square sign isn't urgent enough because all street signs and highway signs are squares or rectangles. Um, so we think of you know yield signs as being lesser. We think of, um, um, Pentagonal signs being, you know, school crossing signs, we think of hexagons and octagons all the way through to the circle, which we could say is an infinite polygon, which is the most urgent, right, which is do not enter. So even this idea of stop um, representing here as a square um, wasn't as malleable as it needed to be. It needed to be an octagon to create a greater sense of urgency once other signs became square. And so we can look back at you know, our stereo symbols of play, record, and stop. And you know, we might say that we live in a kind of post battle house reality where you know, you know, Kandinsky would be giving you this, you know, the color test where each of these shapes is also supposed to have an intrinsic color. I think what's fascinating is we start to look between you know, Eurocentric frameworks and paradigms and new ways to see even our historical past we can start to imagine that you know it might actually not be the Bauhaus. It might not be the domain you know of a particular moment in Germany, but it could also be you know um, the influence of of Africa and African art and patterns and motifs into this you know arts and crafts you know school. And it's interesting just to then you know as Sun Ra imagined a different historical past, we can start to at least be critical of certain types of, um, of paradigms or you know, historical trajectories, um, because they may be more complex, more nuanced. We may actually see ourselves in a past where we otherwise didn't. So a sure depiction of a Voros cone, most likely, is a bi-directional Voros cone, uh, where similar to Sun Ra, we can look both at the imagined future and the imagined past. And it's just a matter of auto reverse that allows us to toggle between um, a history that we feel um, tells our personal truth and holds our imagination and a future that ultimately holds dear our wishes. Um, and this is a sketch that I've been working on, which is my own attempt at multi-stable writing, which is you know thinking about this idea of the word best actually being made of the same components as the word worst. The idea of the letter F and the word forest um, being you know, um, translatable as a single shape going between um, a phonetic letter and a morphemic character. I just moved from Rhode Island where I often visited Newport and it, this was a kind of toggling between um, you know, kind of Ghanaian influences of, um, of words um, that became for me um, hand in hand with the experience um, of living in Rhode Island, which was um, you know, one of the vertices of the triangle trade. And then ultimately the idea of light, and my hero MC Light, um, Light as a Rock, thinking about language itself as being multi-stable, even a misspelling, you know, communicating that light is attributed to a person and light is essentially generic. Thank you.
Thank you, Forrest. Um, so I think I will begin with the question. We do, we do have now a great deal of time really to, I guess, engage. Um, and we also will let those who are attending know that any questions that they have or something that they want to go back to, which perhaps in the spirit of auto reverse may be fitting. Um, please, you know, if there was a slide or something in particular that was said that it would be interesting to hear more of, you know, please definitely fill the Q&A function with that question. Um, so I think I'm curious to know a little bit more about this um, position of instability. I mean, maybe I'm um, wrongfully calling it instability, <laughs> but multi-stability and what other frameworks other than visual did you encounter that kind of support? Maybe this as a design future or if you encountered any? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, well, I think it's interesting. I think you, you, you kind of start with examples from um, psychology, where psychology was trying to express, you know, these different types of perceptual phenomena, like the two faces and the vase. Um, and it's fascinating because I think it speaks to, um, at least spoke to me in the last couple of years, that many of us were absolutely seeing a different reality, where whether it was a political reality, whether it was um, seeing um, different, you know, kind of systems um, in different lights. And so for me, multi-stability is um, an acknowledgement of that perceptual phenomenon that is ongoing, but to wield it as an intentional choice um, is, is fascinating for a couple of reasons. One, I think um, it's interesting, the thematic currents um, of IDS are in some ways, like I feel the different stations of my practice. I feel oftentimes I, I start in aftermath and my brief starts in a moment, which feels like a moment of crisis or a moment to avoid a crisis. I think of mark making and inscription as um, something that is trying to be a reductive emblem of something greater um, or kind of telegraphing a particular experience. Um, but more and more trying to think of solving, you know, some of these, you know, wicked problems of whether it's climate action or some of these things that are requiring so many different people to think and see things differently. Um, multi-stability has become, you know, a way for, you know, for me to interrogate, you know, the polar bear on a melting piece of ice um, or other types of, you know, symbols and signs that um, maybe haven't worked. Um, so what type of imagery, what type of, you know, construction, you know, incites action? I think I respond to things visually, um, but I was very quick to start to ask myself, what are other moments where I've experienced you know, multi-stability. So there's there's acoustic multi-stability, which I was, you know, listening again and again to MC Light's Light as a Rock. And, you know, she keeps toggling between I am the light. And then she's like L-Y-T-E. And she's like, it's like, so you're, you're immediately seeing the words L-I-G-H-T. Then you're saying L-Y-T-E. Then you're saying she's going with a certain type of messianic um, image that she's conjuring. And then light as a rock, of course, is relative to to weight. And so we're going between, you know, all these different multi-stable images through language. And it made me think, oh, that's interesting. Like multi-stability can happen through lyrics and through the spoken word. It can happen through juxtaposition. Um, it can happen through through an image, an intentional construction. Um, for me, it was incredibly exciting because I think the thing that I'm most concerned about is always the is always being trapped or always feeling like I don't have enough room uh, to, to move or to choose to see something um, as fatalistic or to see something as um, you know as dictated by some kind of outside agency. 